Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. <clears throat> so this is the instruction on how to receive those who come into our fellowship. In this case, those who come in who might be weak in their faith in one way or another. And often new cart Christians are weak in their faith. Uh, they've not been fed the Word of God so that their faith has grown strong, unfortunately. Uh, often we, we encounter that. And so we receive them with some weaknesses in their faith. And uh, we trust that they will grow. Often it's no fault of their own. They just have been in a fellowship where the Bible wasn't preached faithfully and regularly and consistently or deeply. And as a consequence, they've just been, you know, kind of living on I don't know, uh, cocoa puffs and getting very little meat and potatoes kind of thing, you know. And that's, that has happened. So they come in weak in faith and we need to receive them. All right? We receive them. And yet not to doubtful disputations. And I'll address that some more a little bit. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. So the other principle I want to address in the opening of this message is that we are supposed to receive those God has received. And they might not be on the same page that we're on in certain areas, but we need to give them time to grow. Amen. And give them room to grow. Because we have a very important principle at Lighthouse Baptist Church. In fact, it's a biblical principle. It's been around a long time. And that principle is that really your faith grows by the Word of God, not by the Word of Jerry. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Your faith grows by the Word of God, not by the Word of the Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. It grows by the Word of God. And so if somebody comes in and says, well, you're this way, so I need to be this way, that's a mistake. Yeah. Amen. Until they see it in the Word. You see, we want spiritual growth to be a response to the Word of God, yeah. not a response to Jerry Scheinbach. Because that kind of growth isn't real. Amen. But Bible growth, that's real. Amen. And that'll sustain you. Amen? Yeah. Father, I want to thank you and help us now to understand the principle of receiving those you've received yeah, and not to doubtful disputations. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you and thank you for your attention. Let's uh, take our seats and we'll get into the message this morning. We've, uh, we're completing a series out of the book that uh, the Lord helped me to write, The New Cart Church. Doing the right thing the wrong way. And God has really used that book. Amen. Uh, he's, he has used it in as much as it has been faithful and is faithful to the Word of God. And so it's, it's what's in that book that preaches and delivers the message of the book yes. that matters. Right. And I'm, I'm pleased and gratified how well it's been received. As you know, we've been asked by a few pastors to do a conference. Uh, somewhat on the content of that book, but then expanding on the content of that book and going into some other areas uh, where we're talking about uh, various issues and so on that have to do specifically with pastors and ministry in their churches. And that's, that's really quite an honor for Lighthouse Baptist Church to have the opportunity to host this event. So April 20 and 21, uh, you will be hosting a group of pastors. We've got 20 who have registered so far. And then several others who have said they intend to come, but they have not yet registered. And some who've said, you know, count on me being in there, but uh, they're not going to register because they, might, they said they're planning that maybe they'll be sick. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. But I just, I'm just playing around a little bit. And I really shouldn't play about it because this dear brother is a real good friend to me and, and to our church, and we love him so dearly, but he's been fatigued and what happened is he set aside those two days, Monday, Tuesday, to rest. But when he got our invitation, he just felt impressed that, boy, that's something I'd like to be a part of. And so that's, that's Brother Chapel, by the way. Uh, Brother Chapel of Lancaster Baptist Church. He passes that little church out there in the desert, runs about 6,000. So we're excited that he's planning to come. Amen. And we hope to, you know, be able to uh, give him some hospitality, as he has given me so so much gracious hospitality over the years. It would be our turn to kind of return some of that to him. Amen. And the other pastors who are coming, praise the Lord. Yeah. Uh, good men, solid men, solid men who have read that book and have said to me, wow, 
I didn't even realize that some of these points are not very many, but a few of those points kind of hit me. Yeah. So, amen? Yeah. It's exciting that God is doing that. Yeah. And then, by the way, church, just, just to encourage you and to, and to help you know your ministry here is, is touching, is reaching out and touching so many others. Um, Dr. Wilkerson, the, first, uh, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. That's that little church out there in Hammond that runs about 10,000. Now, this morning's message, I'm going to preach against getting enamored of big churches. So I thought I'd introduce the message this way. Because I don't, when I go into that part of the message, I don't want you to feel like I'm against big churches. There are some large churches that have some excellent, godly, committed men leading them. It's just so many times they're idiots in the larger churches, but not always. And I wanted you to know that before I launch into this message. So uh, Dr. Wilkerson, he pastors that little church out there in Hammond of about 10,000, he, he texted me this morning and said, send me a case of your book, Newcart Church. He wants to take half that case and give them away to pastors. Amen. And the other half he wants to put in his bookstore. God is moving. God is working. God is using uh, our, our church to touch the lives of other churches. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? It's very exciting. Now, Having gone through that book together from the book from which that book is derived, we have uh, come to a point where we want to talk about the importance and the issues of transitioning from a new cart type church to an old paths type church. So we spent quite a lot of time talking about what is an old paths church. What does it look like as contrasted to what we would call or refer to as a new cart church? After noting that we live today in a time when there are more and larger churches than ever before in the history of the church. Yet today, in this day in which we live, the gospel is blocked from being preached at all in more nations than ever before. And this last bastion of of Christianized culture, this last nation on earth to identify itself as one nation under God has turned her back on God and by everyone's estimation is on her way to hell with all those other nations that have turned their backs on God or that have forgotten God, Psalm 917. So we said the problem is that the enemy has filled the churches with tares and what we call new cart churches preaching their watered down new cart gospel has not done nothing more than increase the ranks of those who in that day will say, Lord, Lord, have not we this, have not we that? And he's going to say to them, depart from me. I don't even know you. Yeah, that's right. So we've emphasized the importance that it's not enough to go around saying, well, I know Jesus. The question really at the end of the day is, does he know you? So I want to conclude this series, a new, cart, uh, a new Walk in the Old Paths, with some observations on the importance and problems associated with people who respond to the voice of the Spirit in their heart when they are involved in these new cart churches thinking, this is just not right, there's something missing here, this is the, uh, something's wrong, and, and they begin to wake up, and, and, they, and they are drawn by the Spirit of God. Perhaps they get our book, New Cart Church, they read it, and they begin to ask questions, or perhaps they're just reading their Bible, and they begin to ask questions, perhaps... They're just remembering back the way it used to be and they're looking at the way it is now and they're saying there's something wrong with this and they go out looking for an old path church. They walk into ours and they see a lot that they like. And so they're attracted to what they see here and they're attracted to, in, to different things and they come in and they become part of us but then as they live with us and they begin to notice that this really is different. This is not only different in some ways that I like, it's also different in some ways that I don't like. And so they start getting challenged by certain things and we want to help uh, in that issue of transition. The last time we talked about digging up the roots of the new cart philosophy or the root issues uh, that are involved that we must address. And the first of those is authority. One of the biggest problems we have is helping people align themselves authority of Jesus Christ. Yes. I know that sounds crazy. You'd think that every Christian would recognize Jesus as Lord and every Christian understands that he, is, that he is the Lord, but they don't think of him as the boss. I put it that way just to kind of bring, the, bring it right down to where, as Vernon McGee used to say, the rubber meets the road. He has the right to tell you what to do. 
He has the right to direct your life. He has the right to say, hey, don't do that, do this. He's the boss. Amen. And it's amazing how many Christians you'll run into who don't really get that. It's amazing to me how many Christians give lip service to the notion, yeah, he's Lord, and have no heart understanding of what that means. If we say with our mouth, he is Lord, then we must live, bring our lives under his control. Amen. Under his domain, under his dominion, under his mastery. He said, ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. And in that verse, you kind of get an idea of what Lord means, because it's connected to the word master. And somebody says, nobody's my master. Yes, somebody's your master. His name is Jesus Christ. And so one thing we deal with is helping people come under that and, and then be willing, you know, to put him before all others. And we talked about that some last time, family even, friends, beloved teachers of the past. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. Authority issues. They come to us having been taught and are enamored of certain uh, other kinds of teachers and then they hear me preach and I say things that contradict some of the things that they've heard from those beloved preachers and teachers of their past. Like John MacArthur, it often happens with John MacArthur. I'll say some things that contradict some things that he has said or that he teaches and he's a beloved teacher among many of the New Cart Christians. And so when they come to our church and I say something against the teaching of John MacArthur, some people get kind of bristled because he's a beloved teacher to them and they like him. I don't not like him either, by the way. But there's some teaching he presents on the blood of Christ that's just wrong, that's all. Right. Yeah. It's just wrong. Right. I, okay? And yet people leave and look at me now, like, I don't know. Boy, I'll tell you one you really got to be careful of is Billy Graham. That's right. You touch that, that sacred cow, and you're likely to get, yeah. you're likely to get real hurt real fast. Mm. We have lost new cart people coming in because I told the truth about Billy Graham. Yeah. Receiving a doctorate from some Catholic university mm -hmm. and standing there and saying that the gospel that's preached here is the same gospel I preach. Excuse me? Yeah. If that's true, then Billy Graham does not preach the same gospel I preach. That's right. Because that's I don't preach the same gospel the Catholic Church preaches. Amen. So we have that transition issue, people coming in to, to us from out there. They've never heard that before in their entire life. They've never been confronted with that kind of thing. And they come to a church like ours, and, and I, I, who knows what's going to happen. I might just haul off and jump into one of those issues and just go after it because I have a, a shepherd's heart. And, and God has given me a responsibility to feed the flock of God and and to use the rod of his word to protect them from false teaching. And so I'll do that. And I'll stand up for what's right, Amen. come what may. I, I don't go to the pulpit and look out there and go, well, I know I'm going to make this one mad if I say this. I'm going to make that one mad if I say that. No, I just go to the, word of, I go to the pulpit with the word of God, period. That's it. And so that's something they're not used to many times. And it creates some issues. And then I said there's uh, issues with salvation and, and scriptural baptism. And I put those together as one, but really they should be separated. So there are six roots here. And the second root is salvation. And we talked about that last time, how it's important to clarify your testimony of salvation so that when you give your testimony to others of your salvation, it agrees with what the Bible says about salvation. Amen. Now, I've experienced it more than once, finding somebody who, at the end of the conversation, I would say, yeah, your testimony of salvation is clear. I think you're saved. But interestingly enough, until we got to the end of that conversation, their testimony to others about how they got saved doesn't match the Bible. So it's important to clarify their testimony. That's another thing that happens. I come in here and I say something like, listen, the, the Bible says that you are saved by grace through faith. And I go through the whole thing and I'm preaching like that. And I talk about stuff like you can't find anybody in the Bible who, who uh, <laughs> he'll appreciate this, who uh, didn't know they were lost before they got saved. Everybody in the Bible that got saved got saved from being lost. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Nobody grows up saved. Amen. And you're not saved by osmosis. Yeah. You're not saved by sitting in church and just kind of picking it up. 
You're saved when you repent and believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior. And, you, and everybody ought to have a memory of a time in which that occurred. Amen. Stuff like that. And they've never heard that before. Uh, they remember hearing testimonies from people like, for example, Billy Graham's wife. Who said, I don't ever remember a time not being saved. Really? Now, look, if I sat down with uh, Mrs. Graham and we had a conversation... I wouldn't be surprised if in the course of that conversation we found out that she, oh, yeah, you know where there was a time when I was a, ch a child or there was a time when I was a teenager and, and, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if in the course of conversation with Mrs. Graham we found in there, buried in her memory, a time when she did repent and believe on Jesus Christ. That often does happen. It also often happens that we don't find that time anywhere in their memory. And when that happens, we say, well, let's make this the time. All right? But often we do find, okay, there's the time. And, but they don't know because they come from a different background. They come from this kind of wishy-washy, watered-down, vague preaching of the gospel where it's sort of like, I don't know, people are just expected. If you, the, the thinking is this. If you believe in God and you believe in Jesus Christ, you must be saved. That's not true. That's right. That's right. There are a lot of people who believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, that are not saved. Because you've got to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. And you've got to believe Him for salvation. Believing in Him historically is not the same thing as believing in Him and receiving Him by faith Amen. as your yeah. Savior. That's right. There's a very important difference there. So we have to clear all that up. And then baptism. Oh, mercy, that's a big one. And uh, I won't go back into that right now because I want to get on with my new stuff. And then divine order in the home. That's another issue. Be, they come out of these new car churches and... They come from the world. They got the stink of the world all over them, as if none of us does. We all do have some of it. But they come to us with this idea of, you know, feminism and, and some of the notions and attitudes of the world against men and all that. So I preach a sermon like effemination and blow their mind. And they go, what? You know, but it's just Bible. And then divine order in the church. Another issue. They come from these churches that have all these committees and this and that and the other, and they have the deacons that, that run the pastor, and they've got these different church orders that, that are not biblical. Right. And now we don't believe that the pastor is a dictator, by no means. But neither is he dictated to. Hello? Amen. In other words, there's no dictator in the church. There's not a deacon board that's a dictator. There's not the pastor that's a dictator. There's nobody that's a dictator. That's right. It's funny how they let me search the pastor's not a dictator, but they have a board that's a dictator. The, the Politburo, you know, the committee of the Communist Party running the church. Anyway, I don't want to get into that any further. But my point is that the order issues come up. Order issues in the home, order issues in the church. And then discipleship, you know, an old-fashioned, old-past church. We, we actually expect that Christians will want to, you know, well, like serve the Lord. Amen. What a thought. What a concept. Yeah. That we, we might challenge you and expect you to step up to some service yeah. for the king, you know. But some of those other churches are not like that. Now, then I introduced in our discussion uh, this idea of addictions. Because not only do our New Cart Christians come to us, and, we're, and we are obliged by the Scripture, and we desire to receive them, but we don't want to receive them and get into a big debate and argument about doubtful things. Doubtful disputations. Yeah. We understand some people can disagree with us about certain things, and, and yet, you know what? <laughs> they can be Christian. We have weird rules at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Weird to some people. They're not weird to me. I understand them. But one of our rules is a simple rule. If, if, you're, if somebody's going to be on the platform, we, if they're a man, we want them to, to wear a tie. Amen. We want them to be in a shirt and tie. Amen. You know, We don't want them wearing a polo shirt with a tie. Yeah. <laughs> now, we don't go so far as to say it has to be a white shirt. Now, I usually wear a white shirt. But sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't on purpose just to say I'm not wearing a white one today, you know. But I usually, I just feel more comfortable in a white shirt. But we don't require that. But, you know, uh, when you, if somebody's coming on the platform presenting themselves to our congregation, we like them to be in a shirt and tie. Now, did you know that it's possible for somebody to not agree with that and be a Christian? Yeah. Amen. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I know it's hard to take, but it's true. So it's not about being a Christian. 
It, it's kind of, in a, in a way, I mean, a little more than, than this, but this is a, a way of looking at it. You're going, to make, you're going to work for McDonald's, they give you a uniform. You know, you go to work for this or that, and they give you a uniform. And we have a certain protocol that we want to protect a certain amount of dignity. Amen. That's all. That's our, mo- our reason for it. And someone can disagree with that, and it's okay. I can even smile at you. <laughs> it's okay. Right. You understand? So we don't want to get, into a, get all bogged down about these controversies over doubtful disputations. I don't want to fight with somebody or fuss with somebody about it. It's just we do have some church rules or house rules that, that have reasons that we, we appreciate and, and so on. So... Uh, but then there's, this, there's some addictions. There's some more serious kinds of issues. I guess you call them serious. I think they're serious. Uh, and we talked about the music issue. We discussed that last time, and I, I don't need to get into it more than to remind you that, you know what? There are biblical principles and there are, that are based and drawn from biblical precepts. As long as your preferential choices in music are comfortably aligned under clear biblical principle that is derived from a clear biblical precept, then there's room for us to disagree in our tastes about music. When, however, that music goes to a place where it's obvious to anybody with sense that that just isn't the sort of thing that connects to let everything be done decently and in order and whatever you do to the the glory of Christ. And, you know, when we we have some stuff that comes up, comes into play that's clearly outside of, of... outside of precept and outside of principle, well, then now we have a problem with that. But we can have some disagreements within the parameters that, that come out of precept and principle, and we come into a broader area of preferences, and you might really like certain kinds of songs that I would never be comfortable with using in the pulpit or using from the church. But the fact that I wouldn't be comfortable uh, using them for worship doesn't mean that if you listen to them at home and I was in your home and, and you were listening to that stuff that I would go, <sighs> you know, I grab the Bible and open it up and cover my face and walk out of your house. <laughs> no, I'd be fine. In fact, I listen to some things at home that I wouldn't use at church just because I don't think it's appropriate for worship service but I enjoy it personally at home. You understand what I'm saying, church? So there's some areas of preferences preferences where we can just leave. We don't need to get bogged down in an argument about it. But we do ask those transitioning into our church to go ahead and relax and let us continue being who we were when they came. You follow what I'm saying? It's a weird phenomenon that happens when somebody comes and joins a church, then all of a sudden... They kind of want the church to change and become something other than what it was when they came to join it. Now, it's one thing to join a church and contribute to it and be a part of what it becomes and a part of its growth, which is what we see happening here with those coming from those backgrounds into our church. Thank God for you. Because we're open to suggestions and we make changes and all kinds of stuff. But that's a different thing than somebody coming in as a mole, you know, kind of underground and then working behind the scenes, which has never happened here since I've been at Lighthouse Baptist Church, but I've had it happen in other churches where I pastored. I had a guy come in that was secret Pentecostal. And he came along acting like he was one of us, you know, and then suddenly he starts calling these little prayer meetings trying to get these people to speak in tongues. Yeah. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, fella. If you want to join a Pentecostal church, here, here's a list of them. Don't come in here with that kind of thing. That's not right. So we had to straighten that out. But anyway, then let's go into some newer stuff. Now, look, leaving the seat of the scornful. You know, it's, it's uh, one of the characteristics of the evangelical church in their attitude toward the fundamentalist church is kind of a scornful attitude. I mean, if you go online and do some Googling or whatever, uh, you'll start doing some giggling. If you've been around us for very much time, you certainly will because you'll see some of the nonsense that they put out there about fundamentalists, you know. They practically caricature us with horns and, and a tail with a little fork in the end of it and a cloven thing. I mean, it's just amazing. And they try to associate us, for example, with fundamentalist Islam. They do that out there in the, in, among the Google giggles. It's, it's disgusting. 
and they try to paint it as if it's a cult. Let me ask you a question. What group do you think Satan would spend most of his time attacking? The groups he already has are those he can't get. Satan spends most of his time attacking and painting caricatures and putting out false stuff about us. But those who hang around with us for a while, look around. I've actually had this happen, where somebody's come, join our church, spend some time with us and all that kind of stuff, and I'm sitting down with them talking, and he says, you know what, this is so amazing. We thought that you guys were a cult. So where'd you hear, this was back in Wells Road. I haven't had that happen in Santa Maria. But back at Wells Road, that, and they said, we thought you were a cult. Where did you get that idea? Well, this one or that one told me, or we went online and saw this or that. You know what shocks people is to find out is that I have enemies. <laughs> it's just shocking, I know, because you know me. And you know I'm a cream puff. <laughs> I'm just a nice guy. Uh, you know, but there are people out there who, who literally hate me, and I still can't get them to tell me why. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? But that happens. Who's the devil going to attack? He's going to attack the man he can't get his hand right. on. Mm -hmm. He doesn't attack the guys he can get control of. Right. They're on his team. And then there's this issue, despising the day of small things. You know, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. I wish I could preach the whole sermon on this. Because it's an awesome message that talks about the fact, for example, that at that time, the people had just rebuilt the second temple. And some who had a memory of the earlier temple stood there and looked at it and wept in disappointment. And the younger persons who never saw the older, the, 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 uh, the first temple, they looked at it and they were rejoicing. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know any better, you think this is great. Yeah. So people who get saved and baptized at Lighthouse Baptist Church think this is the greatest thing since apple pie. They don't think of it as a small church because they got saved and baptized here. They've never seen anything else. But those who come to us with some of these other churches where it's really, they're really large and some of this, they come into a small church like this and they, it's a hard thing for them. They keep dealing with this, where is everybody? And they can't help it. It's like, boy, there's, the church I was in before, it was like full. You could hardly find a seat. But man, there are a lot of seats. There are a lot of empty seats in here. And, is there something wrong? Right? That's what happens. They think, what? There's something I'm not seeing. There must be something wrong. When the fact is, it's probably because of something right. Amen. Yeah. And not because of something wrong. And the reason that church is full and overflowing is very likely because something wrong. Mm -hmm. And not because of something right. Yeah. So don't despise the day of small things. Everything starts small and grows. Some things grow slower than others. And I like to say, you know, if you want an oak, you got to wait for it. If you want some little, you know, what kind of tree grows real fast in shallow roots? Yeah, one of those. If you want one of those, no problem. If you want an oak, you got to wait for it. It takes time to develop a great and mighty oak. And we're, we're, we plant oaks around here. We don't do the other kind. I wish I could think of, one of the, what the other kind are called. But anyway, and then join the world in disdain for God's prophet, for God's messenger. Micaiah in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 13, was advised by his peers, hey, look, Micaiah, I've been sent to bring you to speak before the king. But let me give you a heads up here. All the other prophets have spoken well and have encouraged the king. So please, Please, when you come, just go along, will you? Yeah. Say nice, positive things. Mm. It always happens, you know, in, in, in churches like ours, somebody comes along and, and they'll take me aside and, and maybe they'll want to have lunch with me or, or a cup of coffee or something and I'm sitting there and, and before long the conversation turns to, boy, I sure love you, Brother Scheidbach, and we love the church and, and everything. But, you know, if you just toned it down, here and here. I think this church would just grow. Have you ever had that happen to you? Oh, you're so blessed. Those devils come after me all the time. I don't know why. But I, very regularly that happens. You know, Brother Shabak, if you would just not do this, or if you would just not mention that, if you would just, 
you know, preach. Uh, you don't have to go into that. And they'll have their thing that bothers them usually that they don't like. And they, they just believe that whatever they don't like, nobody else does either. Now, that's typical. We're, we're, most of us are kind of built that way. We've got to watch out for that. But they think because it nettles them, it must nettle everyone else. And this poor pastor, this poor Micaiah, if only he understood, if he, <laughs> if he wouldn't speak this and wouldn't speak that, then things would be okay, and the church could really grow then because, boy, I see a lot of potential. I remember as a young man, I preached a revival down in Fort Bragg, and a guy came every night and was just enthralled and listened and really got into the messages and loved it. And he came to me afterwards, and he said, uh, listen, young man, he was an older guy, he said, young man, I'm going to give your name to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association because they can really use a guy with your fire and, and I was young then, didn't know a lot about it. And it was kind of flattering. And I said, well, thank you. He said, I be, I gotta, but I got to give you a couple of pointers. Mm. And by the time he got done with his pointers, I had no points left. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he just knocked all the edges off and, and, would, and would require me to become something that I would despise and would never have any respect for. And I just told him, I said, please don't bother. Because I can tell you right now, there's no way I'll fit in. And that was back when I was a very young man. So this has gone on throughout my ministry where somebody thinks that, boy, if only Brother Scheidbach would just be a little bit this way or that way, then he could have a big ministry too. And I decided years and years and years and years ago, I have no interest in a big ministry. I have only this interest that my ministry honors God. Amen. That's the only thing that matters to me. Amen. But be careful about that spirit of joining the Micaiahs. Or the, the, the counselors of Micaiah. And then Jeremiah, bless his heart. Jeremiah was given such an amazing vision for ministry in Jer Jeremiah chapter 1. You're going to bring down governments and raise them up. I mean, you're going to be, whoo, you're going to be a worldwide impact. That's what Jeremiah was told. Well, his ministry turned out to be a worldwide flop. And it was so bad at one point in his life, he wanted to quit, didn't he? Yeah. So I said, I'm done. I quit. But they just said, but the word burned in my bones and I could not forbear. Amen. And he went on and finished out his ministry. And we look back on the ministry of Jeremiah as among the greatest ministries, among the greatest of all God's prophets, right there along, among, with the top names. But you know, during his entire life, he was despised and rejected. He was just uh, cast aside. As He was marginalized. It must be hard to be a follower of a Jeremiah. That must be tough. Think about it. All the other prophets in his day had large crowds, had the attention of the king and the favor of the people. And Jeremiah struggled along Every time he preached, somebody wanted to put him in jail. Well, not every time, but often. They were burning his books, cutting him up with pen knives, rejected, despised, scorned. I think sometimes about the families of Daniel and the families of, of, of Ezekiel as well, even, because Jeremiah was the older among them. The families of those great who almost certainly attended to Jeremiah's ministry. They must have gone to assembly to hear Jeremiah preach and looked around and wondered, wow. When down the street gathered around Hananiah, there was a great crowd. But Daniel's family and, and Ezekiel's family and some of the others, they were there faithfully at Jeremiah's church, if you will, his preaching. And they attended to that. But look how they turned out as opposed to how the rest ended up. They ended up going off into judgment. And God used Daniel and Ezekiel to carry God's people through the time of judgment. Don't despise the day of small things. Be careful about that. And then vicarious success syndrome. VSS. <laughs> vicarious success syndrome. Be careful. Success is very seductive. It's also a very elusive definition. How do you define success? Is it entirely measured by nickels and noses? 
If you define success at a church by nickels and noses, then you look at the offering and the attendance numbers and you decide whether or not the ministry is successful. If that was the criteria by which Jeremiah's ministry would be evaluated, he would have to be considered to be a failure. Oh, by the way, Jesus Christ had some pretty low times too. One time he reduced his congregation all the way down to the 12. From a following of thousands to just only 12 left. It's interesting, isn't it? We don't measure the success of a ministry by nickels and noses. Obviously, we're interested in the noses. We're glad you're here. And the nickels help. They pay for things and get things done and they extend ministry and all that. The nickels are good and the noses are fine. Amen. Just keep them clean. (laughs) I got Heather on that one. (laughs) But... So yeah, we're fine. Nickels and noses, that's an important part of it, I guess, but it's way down there below the criteria that actually defines success for a ministry. I don't have time to outline that criteria right now, but I think you know just intuitively. Yeah, there's something wrong with the idea of thinking a ministry must be great if it's big. No, a ministry can be really bad and yet be big. In fact, it can be big because it's bad. Carnal people like bad. Carnal people don't like a church like ours. It's not fun. Of course, I'm kind of having some fun with you right now. Last week was really fun. The last time was really fun. Dealing with the music, you know. know, I'm not going to dance for you today. we got a guest preacher here. He'll go out and tell everybody, Pastor Shabbat dances in the pulpit. There's no way I'm going to... But anyway. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we had a lot of fun, and we're having some fun with this. But you know, you've been around a while. Sometimes we get right down to some serious, we, we set the plow deep, and we really cut sometimes. And we just let it out there. Well, the flesh doesn't like that. That's right. I've often said to our staff and some of our leadership, I said, guys, you know, sometimes preaching serves the body as well in what that preaching turns away from the church as it does in the preaching that attracts them to the church. Amen? It's very important to understand that. The the math of church growth includes subtraction. Read the book of Acts. There's addition, multiplication, there was division, and subtraction. So sometimes it's necessary for the body to purge the old leaven. And if somebody gets their nose all bent out of shape and gets angry at sincere and honest preaching, then all we can do is hope they'll get right. But if they don't and they leave, we just have to say goodbye. As painful as it is, right? I mean, you know, what can, what can we say? We're not going to change the preaching. Amen. Amen. That's not going to happen. No group in the church or no individual in the church is going to ever be allowed to reach up and grab this pulpit and take over. They can't do it. We don't stand for that. Amen? And I believe I must steward and make careful, be careful that this pulpit remains dedicated to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Amen. Yes. I consider that my stewardship responsibility. Yes. So I've got to be careful about that. And again, it doesn't mean we don't take advice or hear people who have complaints and think about it and pray about it and make, and make changes and make, uh, you know, it, it, it might shock you to hear I'm not perfect. I hope that doesn't cause somebody to leave. <laughs> You're not perfect? Well, forget it. I'm going to go find a perfect pastor. Well, when you find him, please come tell me I want to go join that church too because I would love to have a perfect pastor like to be one, but I'm not, probably never will be. So obviously there's, you know, going to be issues and differences and stuff like this to grow and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, imagine, and there are pastors like this, God help them, whose, whose ministry is entirely controlled by their fears of what somebody might say. How sad to live out your ministry fearful that any minute now you're going to say something somebody's going to get mad about and leave. And I've talked to some pastors of pretty large churches who have said that very thing to me. 
And that's pretty sad. I remember one guy said to me, you know what? If I preach like you did today, half of my church will be gone within a month. And I told him, you know, your church is already gone. That's what exactly what I told him. Thank you, preacher. That's exactly what I said. You, your church is already gone. Half your church is already out from under your ministry. You just don't know it. Anyway, some of these people even entertain the vanity of imagining that their presence somehow is what accounted for the success. I've had people come along who, who come into our church and they tell me all about the big church they were a member of before and how big it was and how large it was and, and all kind of stuff. And, and it's almost as if they think that the reason that church was big was because they were there and that now that I'm here, you're going to get big too. <laughs> it's bizarre. These vanities that people entertain and that get stuck in their head, it's silly. Because that's not true at all. But vicarious success syndrome, the feeling that, that somehow being associated with a large church makes them large. That somehow if I'm a member of a big church and associated, identify with a big church, that makes me big. It doesn't. It just makes you one person inside of a big church. That's all it is. And of course we'd like to build big. We, we want to have more people come. We want to build out the back. We want to expand our ministry. We want to expand our outreach. I've often said, this church is the largest little church in America because of our extended outreach. And I mentioned some of that this morning through our books and, and through our podcast thing. You know, good night. We have a pretty wide outreach. Our outreach is as big as a lot of the larger churches that I, I know about. And yet, we're not a real big church. And nobody's a big shot around here. We're all little shots. That's right. Nobody's a big shot. I don't even believe in that. Jesus Christ is the big shot. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is what we're all about and what it's all about. Sometimes it requires a humbling of oneself to identify with a small congregation, though. Now, uh, as I feared, I'm not quite done. And so I'll have to do this again next Sunday. I'm going to be home for a while. Hallelujah. Amen. I've been traveling quite a lot lately in the first couple of months of this year, but I get to be home now for a good long run. Amen. Amen. At least three of you are glad about that. <laughs> I can leave if you want me to. I, <laughs> I'm just kidding around. But anyway, we will address this again. And just for Brother Gettys, uh, you know, this is a little different, this particular message, this set. When we're talking about transitioning from a new cart background into an old past church, there are some challenges that you face. Amen. There are some bumps on the road. And I want you to know that we receive you. And that we don't feel like the Lord doesn't receive you. We look at you as received folks. Received by us and received by the Lord. And just hopefully you'll make it through the transition. Amen. Settle in and become an old pather. We're going to get a little badge for people to wear. I'm an old pather. There you go. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. Let's stand together in the presence of the Lord.